Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Files. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, where we talk bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. I'm coming live from the Emily Bronte room of a holiday cottage that I'm renting here in Haworth, Yorkshire, UK. Each room is named after a member of the Bronte family. Charlotte and Anne are bedrooms, and Bramwell is a toilet. So, there you go. It seems fitting that I'm recording the introduction here in Haworth, a short distance from the parsonage where they live together, producing their enduring literary fiction. I've argued elsewhere, along with others, that the family were possibly the first recorded fantasy role players, in the same sense that we know it today. The siblings were responsible for creating the worlds of Gondol and Angria, complex fictional fantasy worlds that came alive through journal entries, poetry and other works written under aliases of characters who lived in that world, from one world-building exercise to another. In this grog pod, we look at Greg Stafford's creation, or discovery, as he would put it, of Glorantha, the world that has been used in many games, including RuneQuest, the first role-playing game that we played together in the 80s. At the time of recording, it marks five years since he passed away. It coincides with the release of the Cults of Glorantha mythology book, a volume in the epic ten-book project that captures the gods of Glorantha. Jeff Richard, the creative director of Chaosium, joined the book club this month as we looked at The King of Sartar, the 1992 book written by Greg Stafford, which was revised in 2015 with annotations by Jeff. This is a collection of stories, papers, fragments and artefacts telling the story of Argrath, Jaril, the people of Sartar and the epic cosmology of Glorantha seen from the eyes of people living there. Jeff guides us through the history of the book, how it came to be made, some of the influences that created Glorantha and the story behind the Cults of Glorantha project. Judge Blythe, our resident rules lawyer, joins me in the Zoom of role-playing rambling. This time, we're looking at a couple of magazines, Chaosium House magazines, which were essential in developing Glorantha as a setting. We talk about secondary world-building, what we think about Glorantha as a setting and how our attitudes have changed over the years. I know that for some people, Glorantha might feel like a closed book, something that's hard to appreciate, but I hope you'll listen and at least have your interest piqued to discover the game world or return to it if you turned your back on it. You'll see that we continue to be intrigued and compelled by it drawn by its quirky nature, the fantastical locations and the unusual denizens, while at the same time repelled by the complexity of the lore and the preciousness that sometimes protects the finer details. I hope that you'll be encouraged to turn the page and at least give it a try. I'll be back at the end to say goodbye and give a couple of house notices. Until then, ramblers. Let's get rambling. Welcome to the room of role playing rambling. This time I'm pleased to welcome the person who is keeping the Glorantha torch alive, Jeff Richard. Hello there, Jeff. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here this morning. And it's very early for you, isn't it? When I did this invitation, I assumed that you're still living in Berlin. No, my family and I have relocated to the high mountains of Colorado. This morning at the book club, we've been looking at The King of Sartar, which was Greg's book um, that he produced in 1992. For people who don't are not aware of uh, the book. How would you describe it? I would describe King of Sartre as as one of Greg's most remarkable pieces of experimental fiction. 
And so the book is is structured as if it is a series of contradictory in setting articles about Glorantha. It's got stories, it's got histories, it's got king's lists. It's a sort of thing that if you were a historian or an archaeologist, you would have and it it's hey, this is our sources for understanding this this culture. What really makes it to me really remarkable is of course uh Glorantha is a fictional setting. And so to create a series of documents that opens a door to this fictional setting, but also intentionally are are contradictory, I think is was was really a rem, um, one of Greg's most remarkable bits of writing. You know, I, it's in some ways it's easy to say what it's not. It's it's not a storybook. It's not really a setting book. Greg always was somebody who was willing to push the envelope and experiment with you know what we could do with role playing games and and with fantasy literature. And I think King of Sardar is one of the high points. And, and do you know some sense of how it came about? So how did you oh, yeah. to decide to collect uh, collect this together and produce? Well, it? so in it, initially, what it was is the bulk of it belonged to what we call the Orlanthe Yellow Book. So Greg wanted in the early eighties. He was writing an Orlanthe supplement for RuneQuest. This was part of the legendary, either it was going to be the Dragon Pass book or it was going to be called the, the Sarter Source book. I, I, you have to look at one of the, one of the Mainz indexes of the lists of stuff that never got published. And Greg had put this together. He had a bunch of sources. He had an overview of the history of Dragon Pass. He had a bunch of little short snippets of st- short stories of the, the tales of the House of Sartar. And then he was also right, trying to work out the the Argras story. Uh, Chaosium uh, licensed out RuneQuest to Avalon Hill, and Avalon Hill came out with RQ3. Chaosium uh, realized that they actually lost money every time they worked on an RQ3 product because they had to do all the work to generate the product, but the way that the uh, royalty split went, they rarely got enough money to even justify the work that they put in. So, which is why you could see that there stopped being, you know, a whole lot of new Greg material for RQ3. And so this whole thing went into, kind of went into a box of don't know what to do with it. And I believe it was David Hall who had, who suggested to Greg, Greg, why don't you put this all together? I, I assume initially what people thought he would do is he'd write a source book for it, a game book. Instead, Greg decided he would put it together warts and all. Uh, materials that he had put together in different t- periods of his exploration of Glorantha, put them all together and then create a framing device around it. The, the person who's gathered this document is a uh, historian trying to figure out the the mystery of this Argrath fellow. I find the way that it was put together just really, really remarkable, but it had a long, long back history. You obviously have the role in going back to this as a foundational text and generating uh, more material from it. But where, where did it come from? Did, did, did Greg create this at the table or was it from conversations or how, how, how did he, what was his creative process? Greg went through periods of being an a unbelievably prolific writer. And, and I, I don't put that lightly. I mean, I, I like to think I've managed to get a fair amount of words out in the the last decade, but my output is much lower than Greg's. Greg's was when he was was on, and Greg would come out, and you know we would talk about stuff, and we bounce ideas back and forth, and the next thing I would see is a ten thousand word uh, story, just. <laughs> Um, and then you have to go in and in and, and the the story or the text or whatever would go backwards and forwards and and you'd edit and and make changes. But you know, Greg was Greg was incredibly good at coming out with this remarkable outpouring of fascinating stuff. There was a period it was harder to do that in in the mid nineties through early two thousands. It was a lot harder for Greg to do that in in part because a lot of his reference materials that he had had and put together weren't accessible for him. Actually, the source material that became uh, King of Sardar we didn't get our hands back on until the year before Greg passed away. You know, and and I would say for everything that Greg ever published, there's ten times that material of stuff that 
Greg rejected. Sometimes he published stuff that on retrospect, uh, I probably shouldn't have. I, I, that's probably not what I should have published. I should have published this other version of it. But again, that's, 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 that's part of the life of being a, a, a writer or an artist. As I was playing in the uh, 80s and then I stopped at the uh, 89. So I've come back to a lot of uh, this material. And uh, as I mentioned in the book club, what was striking to me is um, back then it was all about prax. And uh, what I've seen coming back is how uh, Dragon Pass uh, became to be populated. And I believe that was based on his campaign. Was it the Colomar campaign? That was part of it. That was part of it. But Dragon Pass, so so Greg, for Greg, the centers of Glorantan interest initially were what we would now consider the West. So back in the 60s and early 70s, Greg wrote this whole series of of stories uh, set in a uh, fictional kingdom of Seshnella with places like Ralios and, and Kralorella and Teshnos and Pamotella. And in these stories, it's a lot of the framework of what became Glorantha. And Greg, Greg shopped these stories around, but it was the late sixties and early seventies. And he got this rejection letter from his, one of his editors at the time, Tanith Lee, and uh, she told uh, Greg that there was no future in fantasy fiction. The fantasy is a dead genre and go on and do something else. This has got to be like, this was like 70. Greg uh, decided, well, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm ever going to get published. He, 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 he submitted to everybody. But, you know, back in the days when people really did read Playboy magazine for the articles and of the centerfolds, submitted to them, to Reader's Digest, you know, you name it. At a certain point decided, well, I really enjoy fantasy. I'm not having any luck on publishing as literature. But, you know, we could make, we could do something where we have a a game and we create the fantasy setting and the stories and the sagas every time we play that game. So we created a board game, the, the board game, a board game. You know, this is the early days of war games. So it was, it was very war gamey. Initially, it was going to be in a completely new fantasy setting. Um, he knew he wanted to have it be an empire fighting against a rebellious a previous province. It would be Storm and Moon, and then you know Moon changes its phases. Wouldn't it be cool if we if I create a magic system where one side their magic fluctuate throughout the game? But you know that really in playtesting that really sucks if the magic always fluctuates in the game. The game there's got to be some ways for it to to be stagnant that or static. So that became the glow line, and that became the bat, uh, where the bat came out of. You know, he had these cool characters. He 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 took one of his Glorantin characters, our Gat, and made him our Grath, and he would be the leader of the Sarger faction. And our Gat appears in a whole lot of Greg's stories. He was the great rebellious war leader who fought against Gabaji, uh, etc. And so he adopted the name and the story. And gave that to his character, Ar- uh, Argat. And he made Argat's best friend, this bare skin wearing berserk, who I still think has some, so they, he must have looked at a Wolverine comic or something with those claws, <laughs> you know, because that came out of the time. And, you know, so you started having all of the elements of, of what we recognize that as, as, as Dragon Pass. And that resurrected and reinvigorated Glorantha. And that became the center for, I'd say, 90% of Greg's writings after about 1975. And then you had Praxis at the edge of it. Uh, Again, I think the inspiration for Prax is driving across the Western United States. If you've ever made the drive from South Dakota to Wyoming and Utah and Nevada, you know, you have this just long, arid, semi-arid desert with bits of chaparral and then bleak areas, but remarkable geography. And then you get to that the Sierra Nevada that that gets you into Dragon Pass. You know, one of the tricks to getting Glorantha for me is is to it maps most of fantasy maps onto Europe and in particular onto the British Isles. Glorantha maps onto the United States. To me, it, you know, it's part of its its uniqueness. Absolutely. You know, you, you say he took those kind of uh, archetypes, uh, but they've changed, haven't they? By the time we get to um, King of Sartre, because one of the things we commented on is that the Lunars 
um, back in the day when we're playing MoonQuest were a bit of an equivalence to the Roman Empire, but it's not quite the same, is it? In, uh, in no, and if you go back world. to the original board game, you know you've got sultans, they've got mm-hmm. those curved swords, they've got the references to, to towers, which are clearly minarets. There was always, you know, going way back, uh, a, a Arab Empire Persian element to them as all as well and if you go and look at those original chits that uh it was a William church that did the original yeah, chit. i think yeah, it was yeah. back and look at those original pieces they some of the units do look like romans some of them look like greeks some of them look like arab cavalry certainly in the modern art that we've been doing for the last 10 years i think we've we've hearkened way mat- back to the original inspirations of this and gone back to the roots of the setting rather than really model them strongly on the romans and i think i think what we what we noted is that as an invading force the lunars were more it's more of a cultural invasion than a militaristic invasion as depicted in King of Sartre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the King of Sartre is very much from the, you know, given its origins is what was originally going to be the Sartre book and trying to figure out the history of Argrath, which there's some amusing stories about how that developed down into what was presented in King of Sartre. So, of course, it presents you the Sardarite take on things. And the Sardarite view of the Lunar Empire is they are a threat. They are a military threat. They're a cultural threat. They're a religious threat. They are, they basically are a threat on, on every, every way imaginable, at least as is presented in the, in, in the text assembled for King of Sartar. One of the amusing things on this is, is initially the Hero Wars and Greg's earliest drafts, the Hero Wars were going to last something like oh, 150, 200 years. They just were going to go on and on and on and on and on. And that gets reflected in some of the goofy dating in King of Sartar is great. Thought it would be cool. Well, why don't we keep that? The, my early drafts use the dating system that I had for my early drafts of of things, and I'll just throw them throw them in there, and it'll have the feel of historical scholarship because these dates simply do not agree with my own internal reference dates. And so when we came time to do the the second edition of it, I told Greg, Greg, that you know it's cool. I totally absolutely respect that. But you know, a lot of people are trying to build their campaigns around the information on this. And somewhere you've got to give them the decoder ring. So if you look at the most of those footnotes, that's all me coming in and saying, okay, here's the here's the decoder ring if you actually want to use this for the game, because clearly that's not an event that you want to have in your, your campaign take place a hundred years in the future. Our grass saga. So that's the first um that's the first story in that. That corresponds pretty closely to the outline of what Greg was putting together as what was going to be the, the his grand Argrath campaign. So he initially was going to make this grand, huge campaign about the history of Dragon Pass and all the events going forward. And then with the Avalon Hill deal, that idea and concept got ported over but it became the boy king and it became the the framework for what became pen uh, the pendergin campaigns so i mean this is another thing to, to 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 think about in the creative process is you know if i'm working on runequest i also am working on um pendergin i do some work on call of cthulhu and i'm working you know i'm working on most of the other brp projects we have in it and of course all of these ideas cross fertilize between between the lines and king of sartre is this great example of stuff that you can also see in king in in, in the book some of the genesis of what became pendragon i think david david larkin uh, said that to us when we spoke to him last year he, he, he made the same comment i guess you could see this as an investigator hand out for call of cthulhu a way of uh, discovering the world I actually prefer personally the approach uh, taken in King of Sartar, where you have a what you're doing, you present is a whole series of incomplete packets of information that contradict themselves, because that gives me the most, 
it gives me a tremendous amount of creative room to play around with because my my source book doesn't agree with itself. That being said, that's not really what I think the uh, the the game market wants to have. They 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 would much rather have as a source book. They would much rather have something. Okay, here's the framework. Don't play this postmodern, unreliable narrator stuff on me. I just want to have a setting so I can put my campaign together. King of Sarder is to me much cooler than a lot of the stuff that that I put together for it but at the same time it's much harder for it's not an RPG book well let's let's talk about your role now and your role in actually uh, developing it because I've got here a Ashcan version of the gods <laughs> of Galantha which is going to be one book that was going to be produced this is from 2018 Jeff yep. what happened what happened next? Well, so we start, the original plan was let's create a, a a Cults of Prax, Cults of Terror book to support the new edition of RuneQuest. And it started initially with, well, let's just hit those, that roughly 20 cults that are in the core book. And Greg and I had been swapping, you know, Greg was, we, we started putting this together before Greg passed away. The original kitchen cabinet on that was myself and Greg and Ken Rolston was involved in that as well, giving some feedback. Uh, Scott Martin was giving feedback early on in this. And at a certain point, I went, you know, I was talking to Greg and saying, you know, we could do them all. We could just do, there's, you know, Greg and I had talked many times that there's roughly about a hundred gods in the setting. We could just do them all. Let's give them all long form write-ups because Greg always, you know, Greg didn't like the RQ3 Gods of Glorantha book. It w- it presented these deities as really nothing but a collection of spells and skills. Right. There really was no story. There, there was none of the stuff that he thought was really the cool and interesting part about the cults. So let's let's start doing it for all of them. And then the number of cults started growing. I don't know how many was in that Ashcan version of it. I think that was like 25. Right. It grew and then it became about 50. And then at a certain point, it honestly was a hundred cult write ups. And and, um, you know, this is part of the reason it took so long. But uh, I also, you know, decided, you know, this is, we get one chance to do this because if I release, if I do part of this and don't finish the rest of it, I will never get back into the place where I'm able to finish this. So screw it. We're going to put this whole thing together. And then I did something else equally nuts. I decided I would ha- bring on Luik Muzi, who had, had been largely known for doing Call of Cthulhu art, and said, I want you to do a hundred color images of the Glorantha deities. You'll do the bulk of the illustrations in this. You know, Luik is an amazing artist. Uh, in my opinion, one of the very, very best artists in, in uh, fantasy art. And so, but it was a big book, and it kept getting bigger. And then at a certain bit, we were done. We were, re- we were starting to talk about, let's do the layout. How are we going to lay this out? And that was when uh, Michal, who is the, he's, he manages production and, and printing and warehouse. He's, I, in my opinion, much more of the success of the company goes to, to, to folk like him and, and Daria, the new team, than to, to us old grognards. They're the ones who actually make the trains run on time. And he was like, yeah, you can't, how the heck are we going to print and sell two books that are bigger than the Guide to Glorantha? I had to agree. You've got a fair point. And so we decided we will bust them up into 10 volumes. And I think it's way more handy. I mean, on retrospect, I think it was a brilliant idea to, to do this this way. That's how it ended up being going from that one big ash can collection to a whole series of books. And uh, and what's the idea behind the release schedule? So um, a couple have come out, and I believe there's one coming out tomorrow. Um, so just talk us through that and uh, how how they'll be uh, released. Okay, so we 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 decided to launch it with uh, the Prosopedia which in my head canon is actually the last book of the series. 
But we launched it with the Prosopedia because the marketing team on this rightly realized the Prosopedia would generate a tremendous amount of interest. It's a beautiful book. The art is remarkable. There's nothing really like that in um, RPGs. So let's release that one first. And then let's start go with Lightbringers, which let's be honest, that is 90% of the player character cults that have ever been created for, for RKO. So let's launch it with that one. And then Earth Goddesses. And Earth Goddesses, because that's probably... Uh, of the remaining 10%, that's probably 7% of all the other cults. And also because it's one of the few treatments of goddesses and fertility deities and uh, these archetypes, again, in fantasy fiction. So let's, let's launch, let's launch those and see, see what the market response is, which was fantastic. I mean, they, the, the, the reception of this has been, Really, really good. Tomorrow, you can buy Mythology, which in my head canon is actually the first book. That's actually supposed to be the first book, but if it's a series, it's a stupid book to launch the series with. You know, people want to have their cults. They want to have their, their rune spells, etc. You got to start with that early on in it. And so we have the Mythology book out, and then that's the last one for this year. Then the next one that comes out will be in first quarter next year, and that'll be the lunar book. And then after the lunar book, the next one will be the the solar book, which is the celestial deities. Then I uh, I believe the next one following, you know, I think we're going to go shoot for about one a quarter after that, and then it goes darkness and chaos and and water and horned god, um, etc., and and trails on. Um, and part of the other reason of doing it one a quarter is we've got a lot of other books coming out. I think people are willing to buy a book, a couple of books, a quarter of RPGs, but I don't think they want to buy 10 volumes at once. I'm looking forward to the bad guys getting their book because my favorite uh, RQT book is Cults of Terror. Absolutely. And and Cults of Terror, you know, that was one we, we, we added to it and built out from it. Um, we added a few cults that didn't appear in that. Um, Sassane is in it. Um, uh, there's, there's several other major chaos, uh, gods. That was one of the most complete books that had been done previously. So on that, you know, we've added to it, reworked parts of it, made sure it works for RQG. But a big element of that of 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 doing that one is to give it the art that it deserves. So because I still love my Cults of Terror, but it's you know it's a little thin on the art. I, th- I think the reason why I enjoyed it so much is that it's uh, going back to Greg's idea that monsters have a culture too, and they yeah. exist in the world. And you know you got that from from the sea caves, even you know one of his early adventures. This idea that they're living, breathing in in the world, and they have as much organization as uh, the uh, the human counterparts. Uh, I, I absolutely. I mean, it gives motivation. Um, I mean, the interesting thing, one of the things I I've always found interesting in Glorantha is is that you know if we think about it in terms of a lot of classic fantasy, the trolls are the bad guys. Yeah, the dark trolls. They're actually, you know, they eat humans. They they worship the deities of hell and the underworld. They cannibalize their own misformed youth. Uh, you know, the trollkin are their kids. You know, they're actually they're not objectively good guys, but we love the trolls. Everybody loves the trolls. You know, and then when you get into the chaos, the the followers of the chaos entities, you're dealing with, you know, some of these entities, there just isn't a whole uh, uh you know, these are the 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 truly awful parts of the cosmos. And it's one of the things I really love about the old original Lords of Terror is there's no attempt, like with Vivamort, there's no attempt to whitewash or or romanticize the Ranthan vampires. Glorantham vampires are horrible, but they 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 reflect a you know they reflect some of the very horrible fears that we as humans have, and that's part of mythology. 
and 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 with the you know with the the troll deities you you know they're they're violent they're destructive they eat us but they're not really our nightmares if that makes any sense whereas the lords of terror are our are, are at least for me they're they're a lot of the things that terrify me you know they are the bad there's there's and that's one of the reasons if you look into the cults books, you know, we've got that little disclaimer. The same, you know, mythology doesn't just deal with the the better angels of our souls. It also deals with the things that disturb and terrify us. You know, it's one of the things I find really compelling about Greg's Glorantin cosmology is to me, if as a result of that, it feels complete. It's got beauty what? and it's got ugly. Well, it's an exciting prospect to look forward to those uh, books. And I want to thank you very much, Jeff, for spending the time, particularly getting up so early, to spend this m- morning with us. Thank you very much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you all. Library use. Welcome to the Zoom of Role Playing Rambling. I've got Blythe with me. Hello, Blythe. Hello, Dirk. So what we do with this, this is library use, where we reach down from the shelves and pluck a couple of items that have attracted our interest to do with the topic of today's podcast. And uh, we're going to be looking at a copy of Worms Footnotes and Different Worlds and the brand new, all new mythology book that's come as part of the cult series. Glorantha, I mean, we're not going to get into the weeds of it, because there's a lot of detail, isn't there? So for a general audience, don't worry. We're not going to start arguing over about the minutiae of uh, of Glorantha. For one thing, we don't understand it ourselves, do we? That, that could be one of the issues we discuss. The fact that we feel unable to get into the minutiae of <laughs> yeah. Glorantha. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get over that. Unfortunately, I've not done a prefab sprite game. So well, we'll uh, well you, you, you haven't done one, but I have. I have. You've done I've one. I've turned the tables. I've I've done a prefab sprout. I couldn't resist it. I looked at the uh, what's it called? I say you can't even pronounce it. The uh, pre presuppo- the presupposia. The prosopedia. <laughs> the prosopedia. Prosopedia. I presupposed it was a presupposia, but it's prosopedia. Right. The, the prosopedia. Go that's on. like that's like a, a gazetteer, isn't it? A listing of all the gods of Glorantha. Yes, it is. It is, and that's. That's why I, I was I was tempted. I couldn't resist when I saw all the gods in there, um, and there's lots and lots of them, isn't there? Lots of deities and gods, and I suppose demigods and things like that. Um, yeah, it's a bit so like it's, uh, it's a bit like the yellow pages, isn't it? So it, I don't know if you have it. <laughs> the yellow pages. If I want to, this is the god of plumbing, right? Let's have a look. See, if there's a god of plumbing. I need a plumber. I need to do some rituals to sort me plumbing out. <laughs> is the one. Yeah, it is a bit like that. Yeah, it's essentially. It's, I mean, it's quite an it's an enjoyable book actually because it doesn't really. I mean, in one way, obviously, it does bombard you with Galantha because there's so many deities and there's so many gods that go. You go back to our day of cults of practice where there was about what ten something like that, um, and the whilst they're in it, there's there's tons and tons and tons of them. So in a way, it is it is like overwhelming, but at the same time, it's not. It's quite a fun book to just flick through and look at all these strange deities and gods and stuff like that some ways quite a, quite a good way into it i would say because it doesn't overwhelm you does it you know you can just pick a pick a god and it gives you a little bit of background and you go all right okay that's interesting they're like they're, they're, they're more like capsules aren't they the descriptions yeah. like a couple of paragraphs yeah. hmm. that um, describes um hmm. where the gods distributed and a little yeah. bit about um the worship of it but as you yeah. say no more detail than that it's just like a bit of tantalizing yeah. detail i think it's meant to be a companion yeah. to the full set of books isn't it mm. yeah but it is quite it's quite enjoyable i think i find it quite quite a lot of fun but it was also fun because i thought this is a, a perfect opportunity to test your knowledge of glorantha which you oh, previously had is non-existent, right? So <laughs> I picked. Well, I I picked three. There are four. There are four gods here. Four gods, right? Okay. Three are real. Three are from the Prosopedia. One I've made up. Okay. Okay. Right. Are you ready? So, so I've got to. I've got to try and spot the ones that you made the ringer. up. Spot the ringer. Spot the one I made up. You know it works because you, you you do it for me all the time. So there we go. Okay. First one, first god is comb and braid. Comb and braid. 
the god Corman bread Corman bread the god of barbers <laughs> he's the god of barbers he's called Corman sure? bread are you sure that's not a hairdresser in tilsley no it could, <laughs> it could be no one would describe my barber as the god of barbers quite the opposite <laughs> um the demon barber maybe um God of barbers. Yes, it's an exotic. It's an exotic deity where, or deity, deity, where worshippers believe that properly grooming one's hair is an act of sacred import and can reveal mystical secrets. That's common bread, the god of barbers, right? So that's that's your first one. Okay. I'm immediately suspicious of that one because it just sounds like it, it sounds it sounds like you having a go at the Ezraelian hairdos. That okay. appear in the yeah. box. Well, we'll see, won't we? But don't say it sounds made up because I mean they are all made up. <laughs> I, I've what? just made one's one I've made up. The others, Greg Stafford or someone else made up. Anyway, so come and break. That's for something. The second one is Hatch Rat Blowhard. Hatch Rat Blowhard. A troll. Hatch Hatch Rat Blowhard. Yes, he he is a troll hero of Alantha. He was a troll hero in the right. Second Age, and he was inspired by the winds and sought to study them. So he's, he's an unusual troll in that he, he was uh, a follower of Orlanth and must have then been elevated to some minor deity. Hatchrat, right. blowhard. Hatchrat, blowhard. Now, if you've made that up, that's really good because it sounds like a Staffian uh, mm. name because they generally... Um, either nicknames that they've got because of the deeds that they've done or that it's like nominative determinism, you know, that they've got a name that describes what they're doing what they in are. life. What yeah. they're doing in life, yeah. Yeah, okay. like, like like Goldfinger. Next one, right, next one is Stinkball. Stinkball. Stinkball is the, the god of dung. He's the god of dung. Um, he's the one of the sons of an alder. And Stormbull. In, in truth, more than a god of dung, he's a god of fertility and agriculture, and he's often depicted as a man scattering seeds. And you go, Stinkball, god Stink of dung. Bell. That Stink sounds bell. that sounds familiar. That so, a son of an elder and yeah. Stormbull. Okay, yeah. There's a, it's fine. An elder, an elder, and Stormbull have got loads of um, deities that come off them. So, Stinkball, that sounds credible. Okay. Final one, Swems. 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 Swems is the goddess of worms. And when I say worms, I don't mean worms. <laughs> I don't mean with a Y. I mean with an O. I like garden worms. I like worms in your garden. The goddess of worms. That's very clear. Isn't it? Very clear. Goddess of worms worshipped worshipped by those who raise worms. So trolls. Trolls specialise. They, 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 you know. But also by worms themselves. Uh, the intelligent race of worms that live at the bottom of the sea, beyond the light. Uh, so uh, apparently, in Galantha, in Galantha, your revelations here under the sea, there are some intelligent garden worm type things. I mean, you thought ducks? You, people complain about ducks. Apparently, or is there? Apparently, there, there's worms who worship swim as the goddess of worms. Swims. So there's worm. It's a worms worship swims. Swims, yeah, yeah. S W E M S swims. So you could have a play character um, worm, couldn't you? I, I'm already thinking of a scenario. I'm not. Could you? I don't know. You could, but would you want to? I yeah. mean, would you want to? It'd certainly solve the left leg problem, wouldn't it? If you do, <laughs> call a D twenty one one to twenty. It's your body, right? So let's go through <laughs> these then. Swims. The mm. worm uh, gods, yeah. um, and swim sounds like a, an acronym for so, like some youth scheme run by the council. So I'm <laughs> suspicious of that one. What was it? Stinkball. 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 Stinkball's the god of dung. He, he's in that, an older and stormballs. An older and I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say that one is almost certainly um, a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, Attracts blowhard. I think that's real as well. That just sounds like, uh, like I say, something that Greg Stafford had done. And Coleman Braid, I still remain suspicious of that. So 
I'm going to stick to my instincts and say Coleman Brady is something you've made up. All right. That's what you're saying. Incorrect. Stink oh. ball. I made stink ball up. Stink there's ball? A, there's a, a stink ball I made up. There's a clue as well. God of Dung and Stormball. Bullshit. <laughs> you see? There you go. Yeah. It's an interesting <laughs> exercise, though, because you're right. Uh, if someone had presented this to me, I would have probably said comb and braid as, as, or, or maybe swims as the fake ones. And that's what made it quite easy going through them. There's some, there are some great things in there. There's, there's some that you'll think, oh, this is a bit strange. It's a bit odd. Comb and braid is like something out of some slightly more gonzo game, isn't it? You know, like uh, some OSR game where you go to an island where everyone has a fancy head. It's like, it's almost fancy in really that, isn't it? Yes. You know? Yeah. As I was preparing my DCC Dynith game for Grogme, I read that and I thought, that's like something Jack Vance, that go into a place yeah. where people's hairdos reveal mystical secrets and they all have ridiculous hairdos. It's, it doesn't feel glorantham to me, anyway, at least. You know, well, it I feels think, more I, I think think What's notable about uh, Glorantha is that its origins are not in Tolkien. They do mm. come from Moorcock, they come from Vance. And as we look at some of the details in Worms Footnotes and Different Worlds, you can see that it's quite eclectic popular culture references that are, are built in there. I, I want to take you back, though. I mean, we've done this uh, before, haven't we? But take us back to like 81, 80, maybe 82, when we were in your bedroom and you were on that very small MFI desk. Sat there. <laughs> I still am on a very small MFI desk. It's a different one, but it's still a very small MFI desk. It's probably Ikea now, isn't it? Probably Ikea. Yes, I think it is Ikea, yeah. That's, that's replaced MFI, but it's all intents and purposes. It's no different. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you're on that little desk, and I was sat on your bed. Can, can you remember, we've told the story before of how we got that RuneQuest box, and we were baffled by it. It had no box in it, no board in it. Yeah. And we were trying to break it down. And can, can you remember what we did, the first thing that we did with it? Um, did we read chapters each to try and get our head around it? Is that what we, we went, did? Yeah, we went through, I think we did it as um, paragraphs. For some reason, we decided the way yeah. that we would get this in, this thing that we didn't understand into our brain is to read it to each other. Yeah, yeah. Like read a bit and to the other person and then say, Right. What, what do you think that means then? What's all that about? And and, and explain it then. Yeah, and move on. Then we, right, we get right, we understand that. Move on. Do the next bit. Right, we get that. Move on. Yeah, yeah, that's how we decided to do it. And that probably as we did that, made some misinterpretations of things, but you know, yeah, at least, that, at least we moved on. <laughs> that we probably still carry to this day, don't we? The stuff that yeah. we the errors that we made in that um breaking it down. But I remember that I was fixated on the setting, on this idea of uh, Glorantha and the primal chaos and all these different, the rise and falls of these different councils and trying to fathom it out and work out what it what it was about. Because there's very little in there, in that book, that initial rule book, that actually told you about the world. If you discount the monsters, there's about 10 pages. That's all there is about uh, Glorantha. And um, yeah. it, and obviously, you spent most of the time trying to work the rules out. I was kind of uh, hoping that you'd work that <laughs> something, out. <laughs> something don't change. Yeah. <laughs> but I think at the back, uh, I've got it here, right at the back under the uh, appendix, appendix or other Glorantha material. And what it says here is that over a million words have been written by Greg Stafford about mm. this world, Glorantha. And that was so intriguing and fascinating and gave a promise of wow we'll eventually understand this because there's millions of words out there that will impart on us what this world <laughs> is actually about it, it's astonishing though as well that there were a million words written then precisely then yeah. in, in, in the early 80s then not not now then you know that, yeah. that is incredible isn't it yeah really and then there was a list of uh, published sources, um, including Worms Footnotes, which we'll get back to, 
this idea of the the wild hunt where um Stafford was writing up his uh his campaign in a in a fanzine and then this promise of things to be published so a, a third board game called Masters of Luck and Death is going to be a thing called the Hero Wars we've not had that have we yet um, <laughs> still waiting for that we're still waiting for quite a lot of it. Yeah, there's quite a few things listed on here that we're, we're still waiting for, but we have such a lot, don't we? And it's such a lot promised. You know, looking at this mythology book, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. stunning. It's stunning the way that it, it's been written. Yeah, it's, it, it is. It is It is beautiful. Um, and the illustrations in it uh, and everything. But I, I suppose it's, um, there's a lot going on, I think. this is, And this, I suppose that's always, been the kind of standard criticism of Galantha, isn't it? People make that criticism sometimes almost like a knee-jerk reaction where they go, oh, blimey, Galantha, oh, God, oh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I always have a bit of sympathy for that, but I, as I as I read it, the, the mythology book, uh, and a bit like when I've read anything recently to do with Galantha, I, I'm kind of conflicted because on the one hand, I have some sympathy with that view. Um, they, they recoil from it a bit because there's so much going on, so much going on, and so much kind of mythology. And I'm, I'm always, I'm never sure how much that matters to the, the guy with the broadsword and the medium shield that I'm playing. You know, where, where does it all matter? All this stuff, really, in, in game terms, how much does it impact on the game? And I, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that that it does. But at the same time, I admire its brilliance. You know, as a world, it is, it is incredible that it's been built up over the years to become this kind of living, breathing mythology and this living, breathing world. So I'm always conflicted and I, I admire it and find it fascinating and, and in one sense brilliant, but in another sense it, it's rather a bit too much. So the cosmology, yeah. the, a good example is in that in that mythology book, there's a page where there's a diagram of the, the cosmology, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, look, I looked at that. I, I, this kind of sums it up for me. I looked at it. On the one hand, I thought, that is brilliant. That is beautiful illustration. And it's fantastic. And it looks, it looks like something that's been found in a, a crypt or a tomb. You know, if someone presented with that and said, this is a, a depiction of the Persian cosmology from the, you know, 2000 BC, I would think it was. I'd be convinced it's that. It is that plausible? You know, it looks like something it genuinely. You know, it's not like some the, the stuff in some games that you look at and think, "Well, it's a lot of made up stuff for a game." It does look convincing? So, if it was if it was a representation of some wall painting from a Persian king's tomb, I would go, "Yeah, I, I can believe that." But at the same time, at the same time, when I looked at it, I thought, "How oh, blimey! What's this? Oh no! <laughs> do I have to understand all this? Oh my yeah. god!" So I do. I always feel that weird confliction in it. That I, I, it's brilliant, and then I go, "Oh, but oh God, <laughs> oh no!" I, 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 I agree because that thirteen-year-old or twelve-year-old that was in your bedroom back then was dreaming of those million words that were going to reveal this world to me, and now I've got them. And I'm still at a bit of a loss. I, I still struggle to get my head or around the scope of it. And I think it, you know, see, seeing the, the cosmology revealed in such detail in the mythology book, it's done a couple of things uh, for me. It, it has helped me to appreciate uh, the sheer scale of it. But I started to look at it and the different ages that it presents and the different alignments as understanding Glorantha as a sort of multiverse that actually, you know, the hero questing and replicating some of the myths that have happened previously is a way of imagining a multiversal game. You know, to go back to our previous discussion on the on the podcast, that is one way of viewing uh, Grantha that the different ages represent uh, different multiverses, different myths. Uh, different stories and different ways into uh, Glorantha. To go back to what you said earlier, though, that that twelve-year-old. What? What? I wonder what that twelve-year-old would have made of 
Glorantha if all the stuff that's published now had been published then. I, I think it would be I think it might be very different because I suppose one issue, practical issue with stuff like this is time, isn't it? You know, time as a as a grown up playing other games and having a, a life when twelve year old had a load of time on our hands, didn't we? I wonder I wonder how immersive I, I think it would have been incredibly immersive when we were that age because we would have had the time the effort and we didn't have the pocket money to buy other games so we we would focus on that particular game whereas i suppose now there's an issue i I agree with you that multiverse thing and that fact that there's there's different ways into it but i suppose the issue now for a lot of people is is time and other games and commitment i suppose but when i look at those glorantha books it it said it speaks to me and says you're going to have to put some some effort into this. You're going to have to commit to this, and that's true of a lot of role playing games. Uh, but I think it's particularly true of Garantha. You know, if you if you want to, I mean, maybe that I, I think maybe that's just me, perhaps who's someone who I think you sometimes say this to me. It's a it's a veiled criticism where you say I'm the kind of person who wants to understand it all. I can't I can't not I can't just do a bit of it. Oh, I need to understand it. I just get it all in my head and understand it all. I'm the kind of person like you always say, I'm the kind of person who reads the manual. And maybe that it's me that because I'm that kind of person, uh, I struggle with the idea of say running a game of Galarantha, a uh, RuneQuest at a convention as a one shot, but I don't really understand the whole of Galarantha. And I would need to understand it all. Even though I'm not going to use ninety percent of it, I still need to understand it all. And when you like that, I suppose it, it it's a bit of a barrier. Maybe the barrier is maybe me rather than RuneQuest. If yeah. I, th- I think taking these two publications down from the shelf, it does reveal that actually most of the source material was available back then. It's just that we couldn't reach it because Worms Footnotes was like a mythical publication that we never saw. We did see different worlds that we picked it up at Odyssey 7 a couple of times. But w- Worms Footnotes, if you look at this uh, uh, edition and it's... Uh, Issue number number five, I think. Number five. five, yeah, number, number five. Five, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is like a, it's almost like a fanzine, isn't it? And they're mm. all available now. So you know, that's the great thing about now, isn't it? That all these uh, publications are available for download from Chaosium or from uh, Drive Through RPG. And it, you do get the sense that this is a labour of love that is slowly revealing some of this uh, material that Greg Stafford has got uh, to uh, support the games. Because at this time when this was released, it was just on the cusp of RuneQuest uh, being uh, widely available, 1978, and um, the board game still having a lot of um, popularity. So, uh, no, no, my gods, and it gives you some additional stuff um, to use for that and uh, Elric beyond uh, El- the Elric game as well that they uh, produce some extra bits and pieces for that but it's the Glorantha stuff that uh, attracts the attention here because you realise that those things that are in mythology this big mythology book the seeds of them are here aren't they they, they the the words yeah. are more or less the same uh, in in this yeah. uh, in this format in this uh, and the editorial document. I think like the editorial is fascinating because you read the editorial and it 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 it, it rambles. It's ramble. It's Greg Stafford, isn't it? And he's rambling, and it's all over the place in some ways. But what comes through is a genuine sense of excitement. It's almost as if there are those million words there. He knows there's those million words, and it, it's like a, a tidal wave of stuff almost that he's trying to get across to you. He's telling you about who's been employed to do this and where they've developed that and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff that he's telling. It all comes in that editorial. It's quite a long editorial, relatively speaking, for that kind of magazine. And it's full of all this excitable stuff, isn't it? You can tell he's genuinely excited about all this stuff that he's doing. In a, And I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but in a kind of amateurish way. You know, in the sense that it's moving, it's in the sense in the editorial that it's moving from something that he's done with his friends, this this thing that he's designed, that's breaking into a kind of professional world, into a published world. And it comes across in the editorial. Do you not agree that there's yeah. there is this kind of excitement there, isn't there? In it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, it is rambling and chaotic, but I suppose mm. that's where uh, Chaosium derives its name, isn't it? You, you get the sense of <laughs> yeah, 
But I think that rambling, chaotic thing, nature, is it does it it it, it, it sort of communicates to you uh, an excitement about the whole project that that there's this thing and they're, they're kind of developing it and it's going to get out there into the world, you know, and be read by people, played by people, and all those kind of things. Yeah, genuine, genuine excitement, which is quite nice. It's nice to read, actually, isn't it? Yeah, and in here the uh, articles about the celestial court, uh, the thing that you referred to in the mythology uh, book, and um, much of it, it remains the same. So the characters that are in that celestial court and um, that are represented on this incredible diagram in mythology, they're all referenced here. Um, so you, it's definitely. A long time in the making, and um, to, to see it to see it in this raw form. But what mm. I wanted to um, look at, um, because when I when I think of Glorantha, I suppose it's that gaming utility thing. It, the, the gods uh, are almost like a, a sideshow. It's the locations I always think, mm. because they were built for gaming, weren't they? The actual places on the map were built for things to happen in them. And in um, Worms footnotes, there are focus on particular areas, and in this one, it's it's alone, isn't it? Yeah, a village. Is it called a village near? It's called a village near a loam. A village near a loam, yeah. and it's just like a little sketch um, and a few paragraphs about a little location, isn't it? Where a village near near where the giants live, and occasionally the giants come down and cause a bit of trouble, and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, and it talks about the village building trapped houses. So houses yeah. that are not houses, they're traps. So that when the giants come and smash a house up, it's actually a trap uh, to kind of fend them off, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah they're um, like uh, the uh, tree trunks um, carved into spikes and uh, mm. laced with poison. So when they come and right. kick kick the houses, they get yeah. um, a yeah. tree trunk in the foot yeah, yeah with poison like that. that's right yeah yeah and it's very it's very evocative it reminded it reminded me a lot of the kind of thing we would have had in our games back in the early 80s a kind of nice nice little setting and that quirkiness to it for me that's what glorantha means and you say that quirkiness mm. that is the bit isn't it that um uh, that that we uh, really got our heads around and enjoyed quirkiness comes into it in, in in many different ways and it reminded me that this is the kind of thing that i would have really latched onto this little idea this little idea of the uh, spiked um oh. trees and, and, and try and make a, a story because you're kind of looking for utility in it aren't you trying to make look for uh, adventure in it and some of those uh, descriptions of the gods that's where um it as even as a games master, it's hard to find your way through that and think, right? How yeah. do I bring that to the table? How do I make that into uh, a game? And there's all this, always this fear because there was this promise of a million words that somehow, if we played in a lawn and um, did a little scenario in it, that somehow we would break the world because something would come along <laughs> that would yeah. explain it differently, and we were doing yeah. it wrong all the time. Yeah, that's that's true. I, I don't get to worry much about that now, I suppose. But I know what you mean at the time. Yeah, it, it was it was a bit like that. And I suppose the other thing with that that village near alone is it also highlights a unique thing about RuneQuest that was unique back in the day, in that whilst the giants are monsters and they are a problem for this village, they they live side by side. So the villagers know there are these giants, and most of the time, giants don't bother them. It's just occasionally that there's a bit of trouble. Whereas in other fantasy games back in the day, that wasn't the case. The monsters were monsters who needed sorting out. But in RuneQuest, there was this thing of communities is living side by side. They weren't. They were monsters, and they were a problem, but they were tolerated to some extent. And that, well, that is, comes across as well. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that they had a place in the world just as much as the human settlement. It was yeah. the fact that this human settlement had um, found a place that was a thoroughfare for the giants that they've always used. So it's just that alone in its far point is mm -hmm. in the way to some extent. And uh, yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But yeah, like you say, a nice little depiction of something that I think if we'd have seen that at the time, you'd have definitely used that. Yeah, you'd have been definitely. off into the woods to chop some trees down, get some spikes. 
there'd be something happening in the woods. There you yeah. go. That's an adventure. Pre it almost always writes itself, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Or, or you know, um, as part of a party who want the giants to destroy it alone. So, um, breaking down the traps you know taking the traps apart before the yeah. giants came yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. that kind of thing yeah definitely you mentioned that you know that you don't have that fear of breaking um, Glantha and you know a short time ago we we started a campaign didn't we uh, mm -hmm. playing in uh, Prax what I think was different about that campaign it wasn't the fact that I, w I was worried about breaking it I still had that fear, even though it was like a series of uh, stories that were strung together by a migration path. And each time it was like a bit of a monster of a week type format. I still felt like I was doing it at a superficial level, that mm. it wasn't, I, w I was enjoying Goantha in terms of its culture and some of the barbarian lands, also to bring in some of the gods and some of the monsters. But I, I just had a sense that uh, it wasn't very deep, and I was letting I was letting my players down because it wasn't that deep. And I, I would I would agree that that that's possibly the problem now. It's it back in the day we worried we were going to break it and do it wrong because there were all these words that were ready to be published. You're right. Now I wouldn't so much worry about breaking it, but I think there's still that concern of, as you say, I'm not. I'm not doing it justice, perhaps. I'm not doing it justice. That's the thing. You read that cosmology and you read the mythology and all that stuff and you think, like I said earlier, because this is a fantastic world, you feel, I feel a sense of if I ran a game of RuneQuest or a campaign, I'd need to do all this justice because look at it. Look at this monumental thing. Look at all this design. Look at this fascinating world. I can't just have people going down a hole in the ground killing monsters, can I? Well, I can. Of course I can. I can, I know I can, but at the same time, I would feel like, like you just sort of alluded to, you'd feel a bit, I oh, it's a bit superficial, this, isn't it? Because there's all this stuff. It's all, oh, look at all this stuff. All you're doing is going into a, do a, a hole in the ground, killing some brews. I mean, it needs more than that, doesn't it? Because look at it, yeah. there is more than that. And that's, that's possibly the problem now rather than breaking it. I mean, they're kind of similar problems, but it's slightly different. I would yeah, say. it's slightly different because there's a sense that, um, it is a living world. It's a secondary mm. world that's been created. Um, it's, and as we've said in previous podcasts, it's been maintained by its fans. And there is a sense that it is, to, to really do it properly, you need to fully uh, immerse yourself into the world as though it is a living world yeah. and mm. your characters are part of that that world. It's hard to get a way into it isn't it it's, it's hard to enmesh yeah. the your characters lives within the timeline of what's going on around them yeah well, like i said earlier i think it's it does feel sometimes like a commitment issue so you've got to put up a level of commitment to go right i'm gonna i'm gonna do this like next you know new year's resolution and i'm not saying this will be my new year's resolution it won't <laughs> but you could say right next year i'm going to run nothing but room quest nothing but RuneQuest, and I'm going to read it all and do some campaigns and write some scenarios. That's all I'm going to do next year. And by the end of that, or halfway through maybe, by about August, September, you might get a sense of, right, I'm, I'm immersed in this world now and I, I can navigate it and feel like the scenarios I'm running really do it justice. And that really is the part of the, the problem, I think. That it's, yeah. And like it's not, it's not a, <laughs> it sounds churlish, doesn't it? Because it's like, it's like you're criticizing something for being brilliant. Yes. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like it's like a I don't it's like a beautiful, powerful sports car that you look at and think, I can't drive that. It's just too much. <laughs> I just can't drive can't control it, you know. That yeah. kind of but it doesn't doesn't detract from its fun brilliance, you know what I mean? It's a strange yeah, thing. Uh, another factor is, you know, uh, back then. Uh, it was just uh, you and I trying to make sense of it and uh, mm. Eddie uh, and, um, you know, that small group that we had in Bolton. And we had very little to compare it to. So um, as as we were trying to make sense of the world, so was everybody else. And we found entertainment in it. I think another thing that's changed, there is this great deal of material. It's beautifully produced. 
but also you get the sense that everybody else is doing it better than you. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's like um, you know, it, <laughs> I don't want to use like a, a a sex analogy, but I think it's that sense that you know you read Cosmopolitan like I do on a regular basis and think, oh, yeah, God, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not doing that. My my life isn't like that. And then you get. <laughs> <laughs> you get this, it's uh, like the observer. It's like the observer supplements, isn't it? About drinking wine and you know, in, in some, in Tuscany you know, or something. Tuscany, yeah. yeah. And you read, you read, you think, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Who's I'm doing not doing that. Yeah, yeah. Who does it exactly? Exactly. Who does it that yeah. way? Who does it that way? <laughs> and and, and um, but now we're exposed, aren't we, to other players that are playing it, and people come to you and say, "Oh, you really must have a game in uh, of." Uh, a uh, hero quest or a uh, rune quest with, with with such and such wonderful uh Golanthron games master wonderful and you think oh i feel slightly inferior and <laughs> not capable of uh of running something like this yeah but then again you go back to that don't you that if there are people who immerse themselves in it and and that's possibly maybe the only game they run or they're really into it then they will be they will be better won't they because they, they, they've done it more haven't they so there is yeah. there is that problem isn't there of you know the commit it's commitment isn't it the commitment it's a game that requires commitment some games don't some games do and rune quest is probably a very very fine example of a game that requires a degree of commitment to understand the setting yeah, the more, more so, more so than other games, I think. Yeah. So, well, like when I look the, at, Grantham when I look at commitment, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, like when I look at, say, Deadlands, for example, just one off the top of my head, Deadlands setting. Uh, there is, there is some setting guff. There is some stuff there that you can read, but the basic setting is very, very simple. It's a really simple concept, and you can go away and do adventures, fighting monsters, and stuff like that, um, without worrying too much about. The, the history of it uh, and all that kind of stuff. I think that's, you know, the my- mythology of Deadlands. Myth- Deadlands has a mythology and has a reason why all these monsters are doing what they're doing and why they've suddenly emerged in the supposed real world. But you could write that, um, you could summarise that in a couple of paragraphs and that's all people would need to know. And that's all you need to know as a games master. And I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it, it doesn't require that level of commitment to get playing and to feel that you're playing it properly. Whereas yeah. Galantha does does feel like you need to get to grips with a reasonable, maybe not all of it, but a reasonable proportion of it to, I to th- feel like you're doing it right. I, th- I think that has always existed. We look at this uh, final um, uh, publication. We've got um, Different Worlds 1, which came out a year after uh, worms footnotes that we've been looking at and you know this is clearly um chaos moving into yet another level of uh publication history where they're getting um more confident and a- again it's similar to worms footnotes there's a few articles uh trying to wrestle with the idea of what is role playing mm. it's in his early days and trying to communicate to people and we're still struggling to communicate, particularly in the context of Glantha, what it is we want to get out of it. And you get a sense in these uh, articles that both in Worms Footnotes and in different worlds when they talk about role playing is they are struggling just to articulate what it is you get out of it. Um, and I suppose we're still doing that to some extent, 40 years on, aren't we? What, what is it that we get out of it? Why do we do this thing? Oh. Look at us sat here talking about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the the reason why I wanted to um, look at this uh, different worlds uh, number one is because it has a cult write up, but it's not in the mm. format that we get in uh, RuneQuest. It's fairly rudimentary, but I think um, the uh, character of Gio, this um, uh, this. I suppose he's the god of uh, uh, pubs, really, and then bars and hospitality. Yeah. Uh, I find it amusing because it shows the paradox that's at the centre of Galantha about the sacred and the profane in the sense that you have all this mythology and all these different stories, 
But at the heart of it, it's just a load of jokes, a little bit of yeah. in jokes yeah. and a little bit of Stafford's uh, quirky sense of humour that we've referred to previously. Mm. And I think this is a good example of it. Uh, Joe is a good example of it. If you spell the cult, it's spelled G-O, isn't it? G yeah. is it G-E-O. And yeah. it's like a god of hospitality, isn't it? So there's a rationale behind why uh, this god's kind of emerged as a... As a as a, a god of hospitality and a god of taverns and there are geo taverns aren't there yeah. but like you say is it's kind of eat at joe's thing which i didn't i didn't quite get the joke that didn't <laughs> quite click with me but I, I get it now so the idea of uh, like a chain of almost like a chain of um, taverns almost it's not yeah. a chain of taverns but it is in the sense that they're all linked to this cult um and there's certain codes of behavior within them and they offer people certain sort of protections of their followers and all, all the usual kind of stuff. But like you say, it is a it is a joke, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. So there's that odd thing, as I said earlier, there's that picture in the mythology book that looks like a convincing ancient diagram of the universe. And it convinces, it's a convincing, plausible, serious piece of art. And then you get stuff like this, which yeah. is like a sort of nice kind of a joke. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Funny. The, 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 pa- <laughs> yeah. the patron, patron god of uh, weather spoons in Glorantha. But also that reference to Eat at Joe's is mm. um, a Warner Brothers cartoon uh, yeah. meme thing, isn't it? That repeats. Mm. And uh, we know, don't we? Uh, Stafford liked uh, Daffy Duck. and uh, Daffy Duck. Well, that's, that's yeah, that's Duck, where... Yeah, that's people. Why, why are ducks in Gorantha? Well, there you go. That's why. Yeah, he was a fan of that kind of thing. So there are these kind of joke, joke things in there. I mean, they're quite good jokes, I suppose, as well, because they are, they are kind of masked a bit. They're not. Yeah, it's not like tunnels and trolls, is it? Where there's a joke, and you go, that that's just a joke, you know? Yeah. Joke name yeah. spell. I suppose they are jokes, but they're kind of there's there's kind of something laid over the top of them to soften it a bit, so that you can't yeah. quite see the joke until someone says that's a joke. Oh, it is it? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, lot lot of in jokes like that. And again, um, this description has some utility. You could see um, they describe the bouncers, don't they, going with the uh, from ten to ten with the wagons. Um, mm. extolling justice onto uh, towns because they've got these gallows yeah. on the back of the wagons and uh, that's right yeah and bouncer is bouncer some kind of spirit or something as yeah. well isn't it? some kind of yeah yeah divine wrath of the bouncer <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we, know, we would have reacted to that when we were younger would, would we have gone with it or would we have been sniffing and gone oh no that's stupid <laughs> well again <laughs> Again, but doesn't it invoke that reaction, doesn't it? It it invokes reaction. It's, this is so complicated, I don't understand it. Or, you know, like the ducks, that is ridiculous. I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not having that in my game. So it's yeah. um, it, it does yeah. provoke that reaction. I think you have to uh, be in... Uh, you've got to be empathetic with uh, the scale of it and some of the quirkiness of it uh, to, mm. to really enjoy it. I think once you've got that, that's when Galantha becomes fun, and I still have, I still have ambitions of uh, running, yeah. uh, running a game in Galantha and having a sustained campaign. Yeah, when we're old, when we re- well, we are old, but when we're old and retired, and you know, time to immerse yourself in it. What are you going to do when you retire? That eternal question, people. What are you going to do when you retire? Oh, I'm going to spend my time reading Galantha and then run loads of campaigns and feel really that I'm doing it properly at last. In my old age, I'm doing it properly. I promise you that we'll have a scenario where you play uh, barbers. <laughs> or worms. No, I'm going for barbers, I think. You're going for barbers, hairdressers. <laughs> Worshippers of comb and braid. <laughs> That's funny. Well, they live on, I'll tell you where they live. They live on an island called, uh, oh, God blimey, Wrath. Rathmorassamangan, Rathm- a desolate island, and it, it, yeah, desolate, and a wondrous contrast to the gorgeous coiffures of the inhabitants. There you go, there you go. Thought, all you got to do, 
Use that as your entry point. That island, fancy hairdos, off you go. And uh, I, I, th- I, I see uh, a group of PCs who are bold, who are seeking out that um, island. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does sag. It does sag. I does say that. Yeah, they know. Yeah, it, it says here that the the cultists know how to regrow hair on a bald head and to destroy unwanted hair permanently. There you go. I mean, that, I suppose that's a bit, that's a joke, isn't it? That's a joke there, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. ne- next year, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. Right. Next year, I'm going to do it grog me um, a scenario set on that island. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it as part of Grog Fringe. Grog Fringe. Oh, Grog Fringe. Very good. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Blighty. Goodbye. Okay, my court. This is the part of the podcast where we head towards the door. We still got our courts on. We're still shuffling away from the gaming table, saying goodbye, but uh, we can't quite bring ourselves to uh, leave because we've got a few things to cover. Uh, a bit of closing time chatter. What's your closing time chatter, Blythe? My closing time chatter is um, the other week. I ran liminal for the first time. I ran liminal. Oh, brilliant, because um, we played it over summer and uh, we did a couple of podcasts about it. So how did you yeah, find you, it being a GM? You some, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a really, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite taken with it, as I think we discussed on the podcast when we discussed it. I was, I was quite taken, quite surprised how much I enjoyed it, because for some reason I got it into my head that I wouldn't. I did do, but I, but I did. Um, and I ran it for my friend and his son. Um, who who are kind of his son's kind of exploring role playing games. He's gone from D and D to Call of Cthulhu. We've tried one or two other things. And I ran it for them, and they they thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, they thoroughly enjoyed it, and it, it works really well. It's a very you know the system's nice and, and simple, but there's enough going on in it to make it interesting. Um, and I do like the um, I say setting. It's not, it's not a setting. Is that but it is a setting, but it's not set the real world isn't it but i like the whole idea of it you know the factions and what have you um and we did um we played the reed legacy the reed legacy which written by sue savage sue savage all right okay um, yeah um and it's about uh jack the ripper um, i won't i won't know i know spoilers but it involves um the theft of Edmund Reed's diary. And Edmund Reed was one of the uh, police inspectors who investigated Jack the Ripper and a discovery of who Jack the Ripper is or was. And Jack the Ripper comes back with a vengeance in the adventure. And uh, they really enjoyed it. You know, they enjoyed, I think what they enjoyed about it, and that's what I enjoy about it, is those kind of linkages to the real world, you know, so like that Jack the Ripper, the hidden world and how the Jack the Ripper mystery is part of the hidden world. You know, it's not just a, a murderer going around murdering people. There's something more behind it, that kind of thing. Yeah. And they really enjoyed that. Um, I suppose that's what I enjoy about it as well. You know, they enjoyed the kind of factions that they, dis- they discovered a few factions and that kind of thing. Uh, and they want to play a bit more. So we're going to we'll play a little bit more. Um, it's very, very good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And well done for extending the, taste of the palette because it's normally a uh, fifth edition and called the Cthulhu. I know. I know. Uh, see, it's, like you say, it's part of my charity work, you know. Yeah. Do, doing good. Doing good in the community. Play this instead. There you go. <laughs> I'll play this as well, basically. As well, of course, yes. Not instead, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my closing time chatter. Well, as you know, uh, we're 15, at the time of recording, we're 15 days away from uh, Grog Meat. And so I'm in that kind of panic spiral of um, getting stuff ready. And in the afternoon, the Friday afternoon, we've got a bit of an OSR spectacular where we're each running games from White Dwarf in the glory days and Imagine Magazine. And I've started looking at mine and I've said I'll do Eagle Hunt, uh, the Eagle Hunt by... uh, Marcus L. Rowland. And I have fond memories of this because the diagrams and the maps that come with it are really, really good. Uh, and I remember reading, I, I say I read it at the time. Did I really? Or did I just, my eyes glance over it? I think um, Simon ran it for us as well, but I don't have many memories of that. 
Do you? No, I I remember we did play it, but like you say, it's a long, long time ago, and it it could have been during the period where he only had the Dungeon Master's Guide or the place I went yeah. on book, so we, we might have played it. But to what extent we played it properly? We... Exactly, and I I, th- I think um I I have um um I remember I was playing it, but it didn't make an impression on me, mm. and reading it now. Um, it it is that fascinating process that I think we've talked about before that when you read these old adventures, that you as a games master have to read it very carefully and closely because the actual plot or the actual essence of the story is revealed to you as it's revealed to the players. So if you miss something that's in a room or something like that or in the description of a room, you miss the whole idea of the game because there's not not a summary there's a there's a brief summary saying how it starts but not this is what's going on this is what's happening from beginning to end and this is uh, what to expect there's none of that you have to read the entire thing in detail and i'm finding that process torturous to to say the least because yeah. you know i'm trying to extract what what are the interesting things you know, I've, I've had a description of every single room here, but what is it that's going to make this interesting over three hours? There is that that problem of of deciphering them. Sometimes you have to kind of almost decipher the the scenario. All the information is there, which is fair enough. But yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, I'm I'm running the uh, American uh, American Alien Werewolf in London one, the time traveller. Uh, time traveling traveler scenario and that that's similar it gives you all this stuff and it's a great idea but it it just gives you stuff that you think all right yeah, that's that's all this stuff but how does it work as a in play you know you quite a lot of work had to, has had to be done to make it playable i suppose because it just presents you with an idea some descriptions of things and some historical stuff and it's like right off you go well yeah but how does how would it work how would you play it you know as in from them getting the mission, going back in time, finding this, finding that kind of thing. You know, then you're know, you right. You have to kind of untangle it a bit, don't you, really? Yeah. Uh, and the worry as well that in the, within that, you're right, you know, within that untangling, I might miss something fundamental, you know. What is it in here that's exciting, that's going to make it a, a really fun session? And sometimes you have to dig really hard um, because outside of the kind of initial premise and setup um there's very little else to go at yeah and i, I found that as well there's, there's a big in the uh alien werewolf in london there's a big the big paragraph of several paragraphs a big section explaining how the time machine works but it's not how it works is it because it's a made-up thing yeah <laughs> it's, a, it's a made-up thing you know it's like oh it's a very good description about it. oh yeah but it's a made-up thing so it's not it's not like you know, you could say anything. Just say it's a box and takes back in time. Yeah, no one knows how it works, but it does. But it does work. There you go. Right, move on to something more interesting. <laughs> it's, just, it's a conceit. The time machine's a conceit for the adventure. It's not. It's not fundamental. It's just players are going to sit there. I mean, they might. Whether the players are going to sit there on that Friday afternoon at Grogme and go, "Hmm, is, is it time machine work then? Yeah, does it work? Well, I, I don't know. Well, hang on a minute. It says here. All right. Hmm. He's, well, he says it works like that. I'm not sure a time machine would look, work like that. No one knows how a time machine is going to work because it's not been invented. You just, <laughs> have to hope, yeah. you just have to hope there's nobody at the table who's like you and really wants to understand it all. <laughs> <laughs> What's the manual? Have you got the manual for the time machine? Have you got a player handout manual for the time machine, please? Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't. Yeah. Where, where where I, I, I just... Uh, <laughs> Well, I'd just plug it in and see what had happened. You'd have to understand what every single knob did and whatever his presetting was. Well, I, in fairness, I think if it was a time machine, I think I'm doing the right thing. I mean, it's one thing to try and uh, put together an IKEA small IKEA desk like the one I'm sat at as we speak, and get it wrong. That, that's a minor inconvenience. Getting it wrong in a time machine could be disastrous. I think I think you would want to read the manual. Work out what the buttons do at the very least. Don't plug it in and press a button at random in a time machine. <laughs> if you ever needed a self-justification for a rules lawyer, there you have it. All right, then, Blythe. There you have it. Safety first in the time machines at all times.
Cheers, Blythe. See you in a bit. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. The Save for Half podcast covers old school gaming and the modern games inspired by them. Listen in to hear about games from the 70s and 80s as well as their modern descendants. You can download episodes wherever podcasts are found on iTunes, Google, and other fine podcast distributors. You should also check them out on saferhalf.com or email them at saferhalfpodcast at gmail.com. I really recommend visiting the Worms footnotes, which are available individually or as a bundle, as a download directly from Chaosium or Drive Through RPG. If you're investing in the new cult books, they're stunning. The mythology book is a fantastic introduction to the cosmology, which is worth owning for the artwork alone. You'll dip in and out of it and discover new things every time. A full, unedited version of the interview with Jeff Richard will be available on the Patreon feed shortly, which includes Jeff's response to the questions from the book club attendees, which were more erudite than I could manage. Thanks, Jeff. If you want to see some actual play of Glorantha that brings to life the adventure of the setting, then please watch The Unconventional's GMs, as they run through the 13th Age scenario with vim and vigour, and features me trying to shoe in a cow. Just a reminder that the book club is available to all on the first Sunday of every month. See the website for details. And the best way of keeping up to date with everything that's going on in the world of the Grognard Files is to join our Discord. Drop me a line and I'll send you an invite. Thank you to all of our patrons who keep this show on the road and next time I will be giving some individual shout-outs to some new joiners. Until then, I really need to wrap up, put on my hat and conquer those wily misty moors. Until next time, adios amigos.